Well, I hope you found this helpful. I know I covered a lot of information. Uh, here I am with my rescue dog, Zoe, in front of our little N unit condominium. And I did want to give a quick shout out uh, to my gardening books. If you're interested, I'm running a sale on my website for any of my gardening books. $18 includes shipping, and uh, you can read more about them if you're interested by going to my website, which is listed on your handout. So I think, am I in the timing now if we have any questions? Did I do this right? Oh, gosh, tell me I did. You did it right. <laughs> <laughs> Are you ready for your questions? <laughs> oh, we got a lot of questions on um, the growing hydrangeas in containers. I knew it was going to be that. <laughs> um, you know, you, you said that you bring them into your garage. Um, mm -hmm. Is there anything else you can do to protect them from freezing in the winter if you don't have a garage available? Okay, so things you can do, I've done, because uh, I either I've run out of space in my garage or my husband said enough in the garage. Um, so I've had to winter some outside. So what I'll do, again, this is, May, this is zone five. And uh, if you're in a warmer zone, a little easier. But sometimes I'll wrap bubble wrap around the container. So I'll take loads of butter wrap and I'll wrap it around the container as another insulator, if you will, because... Plants and containers don't have the same insulation of the earth as they do, obviously, standing, uh, sitting above ground. So I'll try to wrap some type of insulator. I use recycled bubble wrap for that. I'll also put them in a protected spot on the side of the house if I can, push it against the east side of the house that's not going to be exposed to winds. I will also tarp them uh, because I don't want um, snow, rain, or freezing rain to be pounding down on that container and then freezing on the uh, soil, the potting soil in that container and icing over on it. So after the uh, hydrangea has totally gone sleepy time, dropped all its leaves, maybe it's late November at that point, early December, I will cover it with tarp. And I'm not really doing that as much for covering it with top for tarp for insulation. I'm protecting it from snow damage for those stems and really from soil getting too wet and icing through the winter. And then in the spring, I pull off the tarp, unwrap my um, bubble wrap that I recycle the next year. And most of the time, things work absolutely fine. But, you know, nothing's a guarantee, as we know, in life. <laughs> <laughs> also, do you have to water them at all over the winter? For the I don't. When, when they're outside, I don't at all. I just say, game on, you guys, you're on your own. I'm not slushing out there in the snow and stuff. I'm not unwrapping <laughs> it. I just keep them in, in the dry storage thing. When they're in my garage, which is warmer, obviously it's still cold, but it's not the same. Sometimes they start breaking dormancy. You start seeing leaves start to break, depending on the winter in early March. And once I see them starting to break dormancy, I will water them maybe once every I don't know, 10 days or whatever. Remember, they're not an active growth in the soil. Sometimes it's still a little bit frozen. It's amazing. You know, they're just, they're not, I don't know, I shouldn't say frozen, but it's still cold. So I may give them a little water every week to 10 days. And then finally, when I think it's safe, I'll pull them outside and just, and I can watch the temperatures. People say, well, why don't you watch each temperature each night to see if they freeze? I don't remember all the time. And so sometimes I just say, <laughs> We'll see what happens. And you know what? I have, because I always use ones that almost always bloom on old and new wood, I have the second round in that container. If I did lose the first round and die back on those first round, the, the old stems, I know I have another chance with the new wood. And then I have a couple questions on deer. How do you handle it? Is there any particular hydrangea that is more resistant? Um, any tips uh, to deal with our fuzzy yeah, friends? I I, I wish, you know, I, I smile with David it, it is great about spraying a lot. I, I'm, we don't have as much of a deer problem as David does um, in his area. And I know in many regions, they're really aggressive. The way this condo community is where I am, we don't have a lot of deer. But I will say for my clients who are in different situations, I will recommend exactly what David's doing. Um, I recommend Plant Skid. I think Plant Skid is a very good product of they have both a liquid and a granular product. And do what David said, inter interchange that with, what do you say, Deer Stop. Um, and also um, Bob X and other uh, sprays that will change it up so deer don't get used to any one thing. And the other thing we always hear with deer is 
get started early because they are very habitual feeders. So if you can have their first or second experience of them munching on your plants being a bad experience, the earlier we can change their pattern and how they're browsing, the more successful we're going to be. And then I had a question about um, the Annabelle hydrangeas, why they're so popular and is there there's something that they don't know, <laughs> like what, what what's so great about them? Well, I shouldn't say, I, I, I hope, I would think they're popular in um, in Michigan. But anyway, I like all smooth day. I shouldn't have put the uh, all the attention on Annabelle. She's been around a long time. Uh, I think she's, she, I don't know if she, he, uh, has been a strong performer. I personally find that Annabelle, I've tried Annabelle and Incredible and Shade. Uh, you know, I'm always trialing and pushing the envelope to see how much shade and still give me a satisfactory bloom. I have found personally Annabelle to be uh, more prolific in lower light. Uh, Incredible will still give me flowers, but if I'm just I'm just evaluating for number of blooms, I think Annabelle has done a better job. Um, and you know, again, I'm I'm. I'm always uh, the budget wise. I wrote the book, a book, a budget wise gardener. So I'm always kind of squeaky with my money. And um, I can find that Annabelle's I can pick up at a lot less money than sometimes some of the other uh, patented varieties of um, smooth hydrangea. Just being honest, just being honest. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, another question on do you have any tips for moving hydrangeas? Um, I guess, it, you know, in the colder, again, I'm speaking from a colder climate gardener. I think sometimes we deal with some more challenges than maybe warmer, but you, you might say, hey, we got our own in seven and eight. Um, but I would say early in the spring, if I'm going to do a move, and it's especially a bigger one, I'm going to try to make that move earlier in the spring, even before they have broken dormancy, you know, if it's and I, and the ground is still diggable at that point so that they have a full season to recover before that ground locks down again in our long winter years in Maine. So the longer time I can give them to go through the um, transplanting process, go through shock, although when they're dormant, they're not going through shock, get them in place. I prefer to get it done in the spring. Yeah. And then um, I have somebody that has an older uh, panicle hydrangea that has branches going every which way, and they're wondering if there was a way to straighten around the branches so that they're a little more organized. They prune them hard every year, but it does not seem to help. Any recommendations? <sighs> prune harder? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I guess so when I have wingnut branches, so I'm thinking I have a one in the back here. I should have shown you the picture. I did what I did on that one last year, pinnacle hydrangea tree. I can't remember which one it was called for, but it was all over and there's some branches going wicky wacky. And I said, okay, I am, I've had it. This is it. This is your last shot. You've just become a total mess. You're not even making sense anymore. And I just started taking some of these larger branches right down to more almost trunk level and just saying, I am going to reduce the number of branches. I'm going to have fewer branches, but magnificent blooms because more energy is going to those fewer branches producing those amazing blooms. And I am you know, the recommendation is not to take any more than a third of a wood off a shrub in, or tree in a season. But I sometimes go in there and I just really reduce the number of branches, especially interior branches that are just blocking airflow, blocking light. I'm like, you're, you're useless. You're just, let's focus on the ones with the right shape and the right angle as they're coming out uh, to create that presentation I'm looking at, especially for winter interest. And just just prune, just go at it. Do it when you're having a bad day. I mean, just, <laughs> that's, that's what I can say. Sometimes it's just prune harder. <laughs> you usually never kill the shrub. You may not have flowers for a couple seasons as it goes through the shock, but you're probably not going to kill it. <laughs> anyway. And then I know you briefly discussed the fertilizing for the, I believe it was the, the big leaf hydrangeas. Is that the same for the, the panicle hydrangeas as well? No, I use plant tone. Uh, well, excuse me. I use plant tone, which is what you would use for pink hydrangeas because it's more alkaline. Um, I'll use plant tone around my other hydrangeas, um, my my panicle hydrangeas and uh, my smooth hydrangeas. But I should also say really quickly, I am not one that reaches for fertilizer a lot. I believe that many times marketing has told us that fertilizer is the answer to everything. And I 
I'm only into organic and I certainly love, I use Neptune's Harvest. I use a lot of different organic fertilizers, varieties of organic fertilizers, but I don't use it a lot in my gardens. I use some, but I rather pay attention to my soil health and add a lot of compost and take care of that soil so it's rich and nutrient rich and has good structure and, and encourages root, good root growth going and use my soil, pay attention to my soil and versus giving it a, you know, a hit of uh, fertilizer in order to get uh, flowering achieved. I do use it sometimes, but I really, I don't use a lot of fertilizer. Okay, and I have some, somebody that they received a, a pink hydrangea for Mother's Day a few years ago. And once it was done blooming, they planted it in their yard and now it hasn't bloomed for a few years. What can they do to get it to bloom again? Well, I'm, I'm wondering if it was small, so um, some plants, a lot of plants, lilacs take seven years before they go into growth. So a number, you know, sometimes hydrangea is, I don't know how small it was as a Mother's Day gift or a big pot for a Mother's Day gift, uh, but certainly roots come first before flowers. The, the plant doesn't care about the flowers. It needs its leaves for photosynthesis and it needs its roots for uptake of nutrients in the soil, right? So if it needs to put energy like a lot with climbing vines and climbing in roses, First energy going into that root expansion and development, a good anchor, good food source coming through the roots, good leafy amount of foliage for uh, food uh, photosynthesis. When it's run nice and happy, good size roots, good size amount of foliage, then it's like, okay, now I'm ready to give you flowers. And we're like, now, 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 we're just impatient gardeners sometimes. So maybe your little your hydrangea needs more time the other thing could be a number of Mother's Day hydrangeas. A lot of these that are retail for Mother's Day, I know at least for our garden centers, I've worked at a number, um, they're not really hardy, hardy for our zone or they don't flower well for our zone. The foliage may and the roots may be winter over, but the bud, bud production isn't there because their buds are more, um, need a warmer climate in order to, for flower buds to actually push out. I don't, I don't know if that made sense, but yeah. And then, um, can you divide or propagate hydrangeas? I mean, yeah, I, just... I mean, I don't know. I've never, well, you can propagate. I know that I bent over the stems like of my lemon daddy and, you know, hooked it down so that roots can start coming off a more flexible stem. And then I cut the stem and take baby rooted stem to a new location. So I've done that with rooting off of stems. Dividing, I just use, it sounds ruthless, but I just use a, a spade, a straight ed, edged a spade. And if it's gotten too big, you know, sometimes you can just kind of get in there with your shovel and just take out a hunk from the bigger hydrangea and pull it away. And that's sometimes how I reduce the girth of larger hydrangeas. Uh, I just take sections off the side. In some cases, like for panicle hydrangeas, well, especially tree form, you're not going to be able to do that. Um, and panicle hydrangeas, yeah, sometimes you get suckering or coming off them that you can maybe take a cutting from, I mean, a, you know, root cut, a slice from, and then um, plant them and, and grow them on that way. Those are some of the things I do. And do you have any recommendations of a hydrangea that would be good to make a privacy hedge for? Is that a possibility? Well, you saw that um, hydrangea limelight hedge I mean, which in the very beginning, I think limelight, I use that for hedges for a number of clients who don't care about winter edges, where they're not looking for an evergreen hedge. They just need that privacy factor in the, in the uh, summertime. And I find that limelight is such a vigorous grower and has really large blooms. And it gets quite, it grows very rapidly. I think faster than some of the panicle hydrangeas. I think that makes a remarkable hedge. Uh, just has a, it's not as wispy as like Pinky Winky and some of the others. Limelight is a fuller, uh, heftier shrub that is great at uh, hedge, at making a privacy edge. And then I think this is gonna be our, our probably our, our last question. For the climbing hydrangea, does it require a trellis or will it just stick to like a brick wall? I know you said you had yours on an oak tree. Does it need yeah. any training of any sort? No, so what I do when I plant those or when I plant a climbing rose or any, you know, honey, stuff, anything I'm planting and I want it to climb. Um, well, I should say the, the climbing hydrangea uses aerial roots. It's different than the, I shouldn't have said the rose and the honeysuckle. You're going to need some type of trellis, something to anchor those, tie those branches onto. But 
with a climbing hydrangea because it sticks itself. It's got those roots, those fast folds, whatever, who hook onto the structure. What I'll do is just when I dig in the plant, I'll, I'll plant the hydrangea at an angle in the direction I want it to go. So I'm like, okay, I'm not planting you straight up. I'm slightly tilting you in the direction to say, go that way. I want you to go that way. And I'll try to, sometimes I'll even have to tie the stems initially till they hook on and then, then get the idea and start climbing up the structure, be it a brick or whatever, a tree or whatever you're using to climb up to. But once it's hooked on and going, you don't need anything. It'll, it'll take off on its own. I guess I'm going to sneak in one more quick question on that. Does that have a soil preference that it likes or just generic garden good soil? Yeah, no, I would just say, yeah, more of a, a in the sixes. You know, it's not a, I don't think of it as an, at really, it's not an acid level. It's not going to want a five or 5.5 like your blues. I say somewhere in the sixes would be great. 6.0 to 7.0 would be fine. It's not going to change. It doesn't change its flower color. So it's always going to be a, that white color flower, lace cap flower. All right. Well, thank you so much for all the information, Carrie.